My name is uh, Mark Bester. I'm reader in politics uh, here um, in the uh, in our politics and international relations uh, program, um, and um, I'm really delighted to uh, uh, to invite you all to what is our the first of our series of uh, making politics matter uh, events. Um, we've been um, uh, we've been here for over ten years uh, with our politics program. Um, we have, uh, we like to think we have a, a warm, inclusive uh, atmosphere for our students, but also uh, we have a, a very important remit, which is which is outreach, uh, engaging uh, with the uh, with the public, engaging on uh, big matters of, of uh, political interest um, for uh, the wider community. We also like to ask questions. We encourage our students to ask questions, uh, and we ask lots of questions as well. Um, so one of the questions, uh, or the question we're asking tonight, is uh, is really is why why Labour won uh, in uh, uh, in our recent uh, still recent snap uh, election. <coughs> um, so we're very keen to have our first uh, making politics matter uh, session to be uh, very much uh, about the uh, unique uh, um, aspects of this uh, uh, of the, the election in June. Um, so I'm really, uh, I'm really delighted to uh, to welcome uh, Rosie Duffield uh, here uh, to speak to you all, uh, tonight. Um, in fact, we're, we're welcoming uh, Rosie back, uh, not just uh, back after the hustings that were here just before the election, um, but uh, I understand that Rosie used to work in uh, our admissions uh, uh, team uh, many years ago, first job after moving down from uh, moving down from London. So. Uh, so we're delighted there's a, a connection with, uh, uh, with Christchurch. Um, and of course, uh, Rosie was uh, uh, chosen as uh, one of the first uh, Labour women for the Joe Cox uh, Women in Leadership Scheme in 2016, uh, and then elected as the first ever Labour MP for Canterbury and Whitstable uh, after the seat had been held by the Conservatives for almost a century, um, um, and by Julie Brazier, of course, for 30 years. Um, uh, who was also, of course, a visitor uh, to, uh, uh, to Christchurch. Uh, now, the slim majority, 187 votes, uh, turning over a uh, majority of almost 10,000. So, uh, for us who work in... Uh, work in <laughs> Work in, uh, in politics, you study politics. Uh, this, of course, is a, is a really interesting uh, aspect of the election to look at uh, in terms of uh, this particular uh, constituency. Um, now, it's a swing, uh, swing to Labour 9%, 20% increase in the Labour vote, uh, and it was the closest uh, Labour, the closest Labour had come previously was in 2000 when uh, Emily uh, Thornbury came within 2000 votes. So, it's a truly surprising election. Uh, victory uh, in, a, in a county that's pretty much been uh, an electoral desert for, uh, for Labour. Uh, and students are regarded as very much part of the story uh, here in Canterbury. Um, but tonight we want to look a little bit sort of deeper uh, um, uh, from that sort of uh, the, the journalist narrative about what happened uh, in Canterbury. We know there were multiple factors. Uh, so maybe so four months on, we can, uh, we can reflect a little bit on the context of uh, that, uh, that election. Because uh, Labour also lost seats in some odd places. Uh, uh, vote shares went up, um, uh, and also some collapse. Many of the pundits were wrong, so many of my uh, colleagues in, uh, in political science were wrong. And again, many of the uh, predictions were, uh, were confounded this time. So a truly interesting uh, election uh, for those who study, uh, study elections. Um, so multiple factors, the student vote, Brexit impact, social media, uh, local issues here, uh, changing the social makeup of the area. So we thought it would be appropriate tonight to explore uh, some, of these, uh, uh, some of these factors. Um, so to do this, um, we, uh, uh, Rosie's going to speak to us for, for a little while with her uh, reflections, uh, but also we've got a, uh, a little panel to get together um, to... Um, uh, to reflect as well. So my uh, colleague from uh, uh, Birkbeck, um, uh, 
Uh, ben Worley, who's a Canterbury resident, will be uh, chairing our uh, little question and answer session with a panel that consists of, uh, of uh, journalist Paul Francis, uh, Claire Connaughton, um, who, uh, who can talk to you about the impact of social media, but also, and also Ben Hitman uh, from, uh, uh, from Momentum. Um, so, uh, I'll, just, I'll just check that uh, everything behind me is in place and nothing's going to fall down. <laughs> <laughs>
there are several significant moments on election day. One, the huge queues at UKC. I was kind of driven there just to see them. I couldn't believe that students were queuing up out of the block just to vote, which is really exciting. Um, when I tour around the polling stations, I get kept getting stopped for selfies and people queuing up going, Mum, is that her? Oh, it's really strange. It's kind of celebrity status or something. Um, but people were going out to vote, which was really great to see. We know that the votes increased quite dramatically. And then on election night, one of my team overheard a Tory campaigner go up to the old MP and say, Julian, it's not looking good for us. They didn't have their usual air of confidence and they weren't buying the usual amounts of champagne as well in advance. Later, we overheard Julian's team say, Charlton is voting in Labour. That was the point they realised things were going wrong. But Charlton wasn't the only village that came out for us. Um, Little Horn did as well, and lots of those rural areas turned to us, which we weren't even really expecting. Um, Labour support increased throughout the villages and the hamlets surrounding Whitstable and Canterbury, and Whitstable was almost all red in the returns that we saw. We felt that there was a new resurgent interest in politics locally. This new interest was all about challenging and overcoming the conservative status quo. <coughs> and you need to think about how that came about. Some might say it was a classic socialist mix. Students, rural workers, town and city workers coming together. Some might say it was a mix of different interests, middle class progressives angry over Brexit, young people and students angry over high rents. Young families worried about what's happening to our schools. Younger professionals in Whitstable and others moving here from London, all furious about neglected NHS in Canterbury and East Kent. <laughs> it is the case that we kept our core Labour vote and added to it. The Lib Dems and the Greens lent us their vote and came out to support us. Students campaigned for us and with us, lots of them here to follow. Whitstable had more Labour signs than I, could, than I could count, and we ran out of signs over and over again. The villagers came out and helped us. Those who had never voted, old and young, came out for us, and more voted again for the first time in a long time. All that needs, it, all that needs explaining. Was it the leader? Was it the manifesto? Was it local factors? Was it the Tory on the shambles? Was it Labour's fantastic social media campaign? Was it by word of mouth? Well, it was certainly some or all of these. But it was also this. At a certain point in the campaign locally, the tectonic plates shifted and people came increasingly to believe it doesn't have to be this way. The unthinkable is thinkable, and my vote can make a difference. What happened? Canterbury, Whitstable and the villages came together to make the impossible possible, to demand a transformation in our economy and in our public services, to call on the states to, to act, to create hope. And now it's my job to do all I can do to make that hope real, to respect and represent the demands of all those groups of people and to enlarge it beyond this one constituency for the sake of all who live here and work here and study here in Kent. Because if we can do it in Canterbury, we can do it throughout the rest of Kent too. Thank you very much. Confession time. I predicted the general election of 2017 wrongly. 
Um, the only mitigating factor there is that I've predicted every other political event since 2010, probably. <laughs> <laughs> and so did everybody else. So, in the words of a, a famous man, I'm going to do a bit more of this and a bit less of this. Um, it's a fascinating time to be studying politics. It's a fascinating time to be talking about politics, and it's a fascinating time to be in Canterbury. I was not only surprised by the 2017 general election result, but also extremely surprised by what happened in Canterbury. Probably the first time that I realised something was happening was when people on the bus were discussing a Yugo poll <laughs> and asking whether it could really happen. And it's fascinating looking across the media at the different reports. Obviously, the national media suddenly became very interested in Canterbury. Um, and there's all sorts of theories. Was it the Remainers? Was it the revenge of the Remainers, as is, is thought? across the country, what happened to the radical students, what happened to the centrist dads, <laughs> I don't know that guess they are like it. And also, this is part of a wider movement up and down the country, where we're seeing campaigns change in really fundamental ways. And we're seeing social media being used as a primary means of getting through to people, but we're all starting to, starting to see, particularly Labour, behave as a movement rather than a party. And this is extremely important. So, um, I thought very quickly, I'd ask, uh, it was okay, Rosie, the three other panellists just to reflect for five minutes on what their take on the general election was and why they'd late win. We have Paul Francis from Kent Messenger, we have Ben Hickman from Momentum and Craig Connaughton from Canterbury, uh, not Conservative, and I'm going to give them all five minutes each and give them a Fearsome glare if they go on the phone. <laughs> so without further ado, Bob? I thought you'd come to me first. Uh, well, in, in a way, I guess I'm going to turn the question around and uh, talk about why the media didn't spot that they were going to win Canterbury because it certainly didn't come across our radar until quite late into the campaign. Like on election day. <laughs> 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 I, I think we were, you know, it's a mental time, we didn't predict it. Uh, and in a sense, that's partly a drama of politics, you know, we predicted that Michael Portillo would lose the MPC back in the 1970s, 1997. <laughs> uh, so, where, where did we go wrong? I think, in a sense, we bought into the conventional wisdom that Canterbury was a traditional three way seat. Uh, and the split Labour and Liberal Democrat vote uh, allowed the Conservatives to hold on to a seat which, if there had been some other uh, voting patterns, they might not have done so. Uh, and I think we really didn't pick up on some of the things that Rose had articulated in relation to this kind of coalition of uh, interested parties who had lots of different reasons for voting for Labour all coming together at once, uh, and you know, it was a it was a, it was a it was amazing and sort of memorable result for lots of different reasons. But I, I'm still struggling to myself to kind of uh, know why we didn't. Do that. I remember talking to a news editor. Uh, I think Emily thought we came down on the day before the event, was it? Yeah, it was a few days. And we couldn't work out why Emily Thornbury was coming to Canterbury. That just shows you <laughs> how kind of you know. It had gone completely over our heads. Um, and we thought, well, if she's come to Canterbury, surely they would have wanted lots of media attention. Uh, but the, the time she came meant that she would have met the deadlines for the Kentish Gazette paper. And I think at that point, we, we were just sort of, we saw that as an example of where the campaign for Labour was perhaps going a bit wrong, uh, you know, to show you how wrong we were. <laughs> um, and I, I it's interesting, Emily Thorley, as we all know, she stood in a seat in 1970, and she came perilously close to winning that seat. And I think if we looked uh, more analytically at, at that, that result, we might have gotten on to the fact that there may be, there's always potential for Rosie uh, to win, win the seat. So uh, I, I don't know whether how far I am in my five minutes, but I think that's a point which I'll stop and uh, pass on to my other colleague. Thank you very much. Thank you. And now, Ben Hickman at Momentum. Hi, everyone. 
Yeah, so uh, I'm uh, Secretary of Momentum, but I'm also the Vice Chair of the Local Party. Um, I'm very proud of the role that Momentum played um, and individual members of uh, Momentum in the Local Party. Plays, they often have very important roles uh, within the campaign um, both, um, as, group, as individuals. Um, I'm also proud of the job that Momentum did nationally, um, where the group was really able to swing uh, constituencies uh, from blue to red in a, in a way that, um, as people said, simply hadn't been predicted. Um, so I think our understanding of what happened has particular political consequences. <coughs> it's more than an academic question, um, uh, as far as getting to the bottom of it goes. Um, so for me, there's three demographic um, changes uh, and really uh, one uniting factor uh, that might help explain those changes um, for me. So. I, I, I don't have questions, I've just got wild speculation and <laughs> conjecture um, for answers. Um, so the first thing is that, obviously, um, the students registered and voted. Um, at both UKC and Christchurch, student activists did an amazing job of registering students ahead of the election, and then students did an amazing job of voting Labour um, <laughs> on, on election day. Um, so that's a clear thing that happened, but in no way accounts for the uh, 12,500 votes that Labour uh, accrued uh, on uh, 2015. It probably doesn't even account for half of that, really. Um, and obviously, the Tories have a vested interest in saying that it does, um, which is what Brady said right after the election, um, because they think that that somehow delegitimizes the victory in some way to tell you what they all need to know about what they think of students. Um, so, so that, that counts part of it. Of course, um, the second change is um, that the working class estates of Canterbury came back to Labour. This is clear from anyone who canvassed those areas or uh, manned a polling station uh, on, on election day. So basically here, the UKIP votes, um, but equally the, the, the votes of first of all non-voters um, from areas that previously really been abandoned by the Labour Party came back home. Um, and this should be a source of pride to the party, just as much as the way we energise <coughs> and mobilise students. And then thirdly, as, as Rosie said, this one is a bit of a mystery to me, uh, some of the villages um, vote, for, vote for Labour. And Momentum actually uh, canvassed some of these areas, Charles and Liverpool, Liverpool um, with Rosie. Um, and the experience there was that Labour had never been seen before. Um, um, and as, as Rosie said, that was clearly the point that Rosie knew Brian was on the wall. Um, this, so this is probably mainly an effect of, of having so many activists um, in the campaign that we could actually get out of these places. So I think these developments have their root in one thing, and that's the leadership and the current political direction of the Labour Party. Um, obviously it helps having um, a, a young, progressive, excellent candidate to fight against a pompous fox hunting <laughs> And Brazier also gained votes um, in 2017. Um, so more important than that, I think, um, was the radical national manifesto of the campaign and how we were able to harness um, that. Um, so this meant that students and working class state had to be voted Labour in the numbers they did. It meant that our candidate was clearly the only alternative on the ballot paper, uh, and it meant galvanizing extraordinary energy among hundreds of activists <coughs> that had never been seen before. So for me, we didn't win because we took votes off Tories, we didn't win because the Liberal Democrats lent us their vote, we didn't win by out UKIP and UKIP, um, as we tried to do in some ways in 2015. We won because we managed to mobilise the radical principles, the enthusiasm, energy, and votes of people who previously thought that politics had given up on them. And it's to those people, uh, I think, and this is a political implication, that we must devote our future energies so, so we can win over more of them. Thank you. Um, so I'm Claire Connerton and uh, I'm here representing Canterbury is Not Conservative, um, which is a social media group um, of progressives. It's actually now called Progressive Canterbury, seeing as uh, we don't feel like we need to represent ourselves in relation to the Tories at all anymore. <laughs> and now Canterbury is genuinely not conservative, we can sort of say what we actually are. So uh, that's a great step. So I want to, uh, I really agree with what Ben just said, but I, I want to talk about 
Um, the role I think that we played a little bit um, without kind of overstating that too much and the role of uh, social media a bit. So um, as I said, uh, Canterbury's Not Conservative was, was founded um, following Brexit and very much in a kind of um, anti, uh, anti kind of Brexit um, feeling. And it, it was also really founded with the idea of bringing together progressives um, really against our main enemy, which was uh, Julian Brazier at the time, because I think there were a lot of people, young and old, um, who felt that the city and constituency we lived in, villages, Whitstable, um, that he just didn't represent us at all as a, a kind of hard right, pro-Brexit, homophobe, as, as then might be said. Um, and I got involved um, really out of uh, an ambition to try to bring together progressives in the run-up to the election. We know that there was a, a kind of active decision not to have a formal progressive alliance, and I don't even particularly want to go into that too much. But as a result of there not being a clear alliance, there were a lot of people um, across the across different parties who had real confusion about who to vote for to get rid of Brazier. And, and there was a real kind of agreement amongst progressives that we would vote for anybody on the progressive front to, to get rid of Brazier. So I pulled together a, a small survey which we sort of promoted through Canterbury's Not Conservative um, to try to understand progressive voting intentions. And through doing that, it became clear, and, and this has happened around the same time as the YouGov um, poll, it became clear that, that Rosie was the first choice amongst progressives with about 56% um, of, of progressives that answered our survey. And we had nearly 1,000. Um, uh, but the more interesting number was that um, people were really, really prepared to switch votes. So uh, I, I know that Ben feels that um, you know, uh, vote switches didn't have a massive impact, but I think that people coming together really did. Um, and 84% um, of our respondents were prepared to switch in order to keep Brazier out. And um, what we worked out was that of, of our total respondents, 81% were prepared to vote for Labour overall um, when you accounted for, for vote switching. So uh, that sort of happened about two weeks before the election. So although everybody said they didn't see it coming, I really thought that Rosie was going to win um, at, at that point. And that's the point where I sort of started um, sharing that with uh, uh, initially friends, but then across all, all kind of social media platforms. And, you know, that's a big deal in Canterbury. There's a, there's a group which some of you may be members of, which is a Canterbury Residence Group. 18,000 people, uh, which is obviously significant in relation to our, our voting numbers. And it's interesting to kind of to, to hear talk of various social media campaigns, because I, I have to say I don't think any of the um, local parties actually really nailed it, because that, that group was really um, dominated by uh, quite a bit of, uh, of trolling and misinformation. So through Canterbury's Not Conservative, um, we decided, because we were a progressive group of, of different parties, we weren't going to um, uh, back one person, but we were going to share the information. And I think what that enabled was a coming together of community um, around one progressive candidate and, and, and momentum growing around kind of Rosie being that clear candidate in the, in the run-up to the election, I think. That information just became uh, clearer and clearer the closer we got we got towards the election. So I, I, I think that um, without kind of going over anything else, that oh, I, I did want to say one other thing um, about about um, the the Tories locally and sort of uh, Corbyn and Rosie, which is I think that um, what became clear through people sort of sharing comments on our group and others is that young people, by young people, actually sort of mean anyone up to about 45. Um, so, yeah. <laughs> um, anyone up to about 45 now really just doesn't feel like um, that the Tories have anything to, to offer them. 
And I think that was definitely uh, true locally and was part of the reason why people turned towards a candidate that they, they felt represented them and that was closer to them in their experience rather than um, someone like Julie Brazier. Everybody turned out outrageously disciplined and, and spoke for exactly five minutes or well, slightly less. And one of the things that's emerging from what everybody's saying here is this idea that we, we've seen an election that consisted of some rather unusual alliances. I wonder way of looking at everything that's happened since the Brexit vote is that there's been a series of electoral contests that have been odd alliances of different groups. If you think about Brexit, it wasn't just um, the, the aggrieved North getting their revenge on London, of course. It was an alliance of different parts of England of very different situations voting together. Um, and what's interesting here is that it's not just the students. And it's fascinating that the media are focusing on the students, and it might be quite a big mistake to just focus on them, but also the villages outside. And uh, the wonderful de definition, which I'm going to now use of young people, anyone up to the age of uh, 45. But what is fascinating is Every group up to the age of 49 across the country did go for Labour over the Conservatives. That's everybody from 18 to the ages of 49. And that's getting slightly lost in the coverage. And I think it's even more interesting that people with mortgages, families, etc., these people who are supposed to be bastions of, of a Conservative vote uh, turn into uh, Labour. Okay, so over to you. Um, make your questions to the point and as polite as possible, if you want. I'm going to take them in three, so stick your hand up if you have a question for our panel. Okay, yes, you're here. Um, okay, oh, sorry, I can't. sorry, it's, there's a light on its way. <laughs> Hi, Connie Nolan. Um, you mentioned about the social media, mm -hmm. and yes, I'm also I'm on the Canterbury Residents um, <laughs> web page, so I know there's multiple personalities on yes. there. <laughs> 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 so, um, my son, for my best endeavours, um, voted green for many years, mm -hmm. and um, he said to me, Oh, mom, this time around I voted Labour. I said, well done, sir. Why? He said, well, there was an app online and it showed where you could vote to get the yeah. Tories out. And I think that's also something to mention. Mm. I mean, how far do you think that app actually helped? Yeah. If we get to pick up another two questions. A gentleman there. Yeah. Hello. Um, some people make the argument if there was a second referendum for Brexit, that we would remain in the EU. Um, my question is, if, if there was a second vote for Canterbury, do you think Labour would win again? Mm -hmm. Okay. And is there one more question in this area of the room? I'm going to just say that uh, so the mic send us legs, and so we'll do the, we'll do different zones of time. It's gentle in the white shirt. Here. Hello. Um, I suppose it's an interesting question. We have an election a month before the general election being the county council votes, and that saw Kent as a whole go overwhelmingly blue, losing a few Labour seats, unfortunately, in the process. Um, so I suppose this, did that contribute to the sense on the media that it was just going to be the way it would always be? There was no greater movement towards something grander, I thought, I suppose, is my question. Okay, perfect. So just to recap on the three questions, was it the app that won it? Um, would Labour win again? Um, what about the local elections? What effect did they have? And um, maybe I'll go to Paul first, and then the customers. If you have any thoughts, uh, I was just responding to that question about the uh, local county council elections. I think you're probably right uh, looking back because that was such an overwhelming victory for the two. And the angle was that the UKIP had lost all its uh, county councillors and not at Kent. Uh, I think that sort of, it wasn't a distraction, but we were focusing very much on that and fed into the kind of uh, now 
narrative that you know, came to be sort of staying true to blue as it were in the, the forthcoming general election. So, uh, yeah, I think, you know, again, that is probably, we kind of put it with the trees as well. Um, as, as to social media, I, I'm not going to, it's very, in a sense, although we use it and lots of people use it, it I find it very difficult to read. I mean, it's, how much it is an echo chamber, I don't really know. So it's, it, I think it's quite difficult to uh, say whether you know, the extent to which social media had an impact. And uh, I wouldn't go into that. Hi, um, the app that you use, Mark, I think I'm all that kind of thing. Um, if there was a second vote on Brexit and Labour win again, I think what's really hard to get across is that we're at the beginning of these negotiations. We don't necessarily have punchy, sexy headlines at the moment about our policy because we're so near the beginning of it. It's all really unknown, and I don't want to sort of start going on about Brexit, but I mean, everyone here knows that I'm a Mona and I'm very much talking to our team, you know, they're brilliant at talking to all of us newbies about what's going on. Uh, Keir Starmer is really well aware of what's happening in Canterbury and what we need to do and how important it is to me that, you know, we keep as close a relationship as possible to Europe. I'd like us to stay in the single market, you know, my views are pretty well known on that, but I don't know, that is only, I'd love to know the answer to that. But if we didn't win based on there being another referendum, then that's our fault, you know, we're not on the job strong enough but at the moment it's very difficult because we are negotiating so yeah i'd like i'd like to find out the answer to that. so um the kcc elections i mean paul was sort of saying you know, that the media was you know john's question was did the media think that you know we would go the same way but those of us that have campaigned in lots including you john and you know in lots of local elections <coughs> and international know that those two things are just not the results just never kind of tally up that way. It's, I don't know why exactly, my campaign manager probably would be really close but the two just don't go together in that way. So it's a different kind of a story. But yeah, maybe the media didn't put it that way. I don't know. Um, yeah, I think that's uh, Well, yeah, social media, I don't know. I mean, the Tories spent a lot of money on social media. And it seems to be, yeah, I, I, don't, I don't know if it's a thing, social media, really. It just seems to be, including in the name, right? It's, it's a media. The question was about the app, not the social yeah, media. Yeah, sure. It's so, between the two. The okay. app is showing people where in the country that they switch to Labour. Yeah. Is we. That's, a, that's very different to social media. All right, then. Okay. Um, so, the, yeah, well, I don't know. It goes back to this question, really. I, I, I don't know if that's really. A, a thing. Um, it's it's a way by which post political processes might be played out. Um, I can see why. I can see easily how Green would switch to Labour now in a way that they maybe wouldn't have in 2015. Apple, no app, really. Um, and I can see why a Liberal Democrat uh, under the uh, custodianship of Tim Farron would, uh, would 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 lend their vote to Labour, or maybe just give them it. Uh, um, but I, I don't. I mean, an app might make that more available, but uh, but I think it's the political process and the political dynamics behind it that, that create that. Um, I, I think it was maybe misunderstood the question about if there was another election. Were you asking if there was an, an election in Canterbury where yeah. we would win? Oh, yes, I think so. Um, <laughs> with bumping majority, I would I would say it's hardly going to go down that that vote in light of recent events. I, I think I think the the gulf between Labour and the Tories is, is clearer than ever, and the gulf between Labour and the Liberal Democrats is much clearer now as well. And I don't think that's been working in favour of the next Liberal Dem candidate. So, yeah, I think we could have, I don't know, it might not even be a marginal anymore. We'll, we'll see, that would be my impression. But, um, yeah. So, uh, you're about the app. I think it's really interesting. There were different ways in which um, information about who you should vote for if you wanted to um, make sure the Tories didn't win. So some of it was apps, some of it was websites. 
mostly it was based on YouGov data. <coughs> Um, and there was, a, there was a lot of, also at the same time, there was a lot of information discrediting uh, YouGov uh, data, which is partly why we wanted to do our own, our, our own research. But I would say um, both those apps and social media were very much a thing because there was just uh, a massive question, I strongly feel a massive question um, about deciding who the progressive candidate was that everybody could get behind. And I'm going to tie this into the, the question about the, the council elections because although obviously the dominant um, story from that was um, blue all the way, um, the way the Lib Dems were spinning it was that the local council elections demonstrated that they were the clear choice um, uh, uh, to kind of to beat Brazier. And that they campaigned really, really strongly on that based on. So, you have, so you've got um, you've got those, those apps and those sites, and most of which were saying Rosie. So you had um, the Lib Dem saying, or oh, based on the council elections, we've got the best shot. And um, and and so I think um, both of those things were kind of happening at the same time with different people shouting different bits of information. So, you know, that, that's why we wanted to kind of share our own um, independent information about who had the, the best chance of a progressive candidate. Would they win again um, if there was another election? I, I completely agree. I think, I think Rosie would absolutely smash it, especially if Rosie would run again, um, <laughs> which he has threatened to do. So um, please go, go right ahead. I think, uh, I, I think that they would win, particularly now, um, that uh, the, the kind of official policy on Brexit um, from Labour has, has been changed and, and that kind of sits much better with where Canterbury residents are at. That was a kind of point of contention, I think, for a lot of um, progressive um, people in Canterbury, that there wasn't a kind of um, more clear remain position. But, but now that that has changed slightly to a softer Brexit, I think, um, and especially now that Rosie's been the first person to be able to, to beat the Tories, I just think everyone would, would go over to Labour uh, who's mainly in, in, on the left. Uh, fascinating, thank you. Um, before I just go on, I was just going to give you a few statistics of interest. I use that app. Uh, there's lots of fascinating apps wandering around. I used it a couple of times, you know, a bit like when you're checking how much your flight is to go on holiday. <laughs> and you want to just check if it changes over time. And there was another really interesting app that said, what's the best way to stop Brexit? And they also recommended by constituency, which MP would give you the best chance of not leaving the European Union. Um, and the other issue is, according to political scientists, as discreditors as we are, <laughs> uh, an MP that takes a seat has roughly between a 1% to 3% incumbency factor, both advantage. Okay, so you can bear that in mind if that helps. <laughs> okay, so uh, another group of questions. I'll point over to this cell maybe. Again, to save, uh, save my friend's legs over there. Uh, yes, the lady with the glasses with their armor. Hello, and welcome everybody. I'm Laura Cashman, the Director of Policy Research at Brexit Research Council. Um, I'm answering these questions. I must admit, or to say I was one of the reluctant deciders to vote Labour. Claire, your website is one for me, so social media does, does, do, it, does do its job. Um, and I know a lot of people who have that exact argument about wanting to vote Green, people to vote Democrat and then cancel elections and trying to make up their minds on who will get back and how we're going to do it. Um, my question now is though, yes, I totally agree you would be crazy, but if the Tories were to learn a lesson and vote the candidate who was young, not homophobic, did the country. And you put you a little bit about self service. <laughs> which that, that's my fear, is yeah. that boys can like learn some of these lessons and regain regain some of those lost votes. That's my question. Great. Any more questions around this there? Uh, the gentleman there uh, is Ham. Is how much could Labour's victory be attributed to James Corbyn's policies and not simply anti Tory sentiment and particular sentiment against Julian Brady? Right. 
And anybody else around there? Question? Okay, this gentleman, sorry, this, I just broke my own rule. This gentleman down here uh, with the pink and white. Thank you. One well, second, sorry. Um, I was the county council candidate in this area. Um, I told Julian Brazier that he should step down before he, he was actually adopted and that the Conservatives choose someone else, and I told him he was going to lose. Uh, Can I just ask what his response was? But I, the interesting thing about the, if you look at the, great, the performance of the Croatia in this constituency since 2000, 2010 election onwards, every single election, the Conservative, when the Conservative vote went up, his went up but by a lot less than the national share. And quite clearly, something was going wrong. And what was obviously going wrong is that, as those people said, he was completely out of sympathy, and Brexit, I think, was completely fatal. The other thing I would say, and I don't wish to take away from Rosie, but try to figure like no doubt at all, that if we haven't had Rosie or someone very much like her, he would have just about held on. The other thing is the canvassing in places like Carton and places like that. These are areas that have just been largely neglected. Um, if you look, some of the areas where the Conservatives did well, like Lee, where I'm not sure I thought back in 92, they did well because they were canvassing the areas. And I think people like to be contacted. But I think above all, there are two things that did it. One what is really far from opposition to Brexit. The fact that a lot of Conservatives thought when they saw that Kent. Um, Kentish Gazette's story about how UKIP was actively backing him. A lot of us did, thought that we had no loyalty to him. This was not a Conservative at all. And I, I think it is really important to recognise that to some extent there was no Conservative candidate in this constituency. There was a Barrowist. Oh. That was part of the problem. Of the problem. <laughs> Okay, that's, I'm, I'm really pleased that, that you're here to tell these things. It's really important to have other perspectives on this. You've got to remember that when somebody wins an election, somebody loses an election as well. And the conventional wisdom is often that incumbents lose elections rather than challenges win it, which is um, a really important perspective to take on board. Now, these questions were all kind of broadly similar, so I'm going to lump them together. Uh, to what extent was it the incumbent candidate? Uh, to what extent also, as you said, was it Brexit, to quote Albert Wheel quoting Trotsky, Trotsky's in the news again this week. Um, <laughs> you know, as he said about all, you might not be interested in Brexit, but Brexit is interested in you. <laughs> and um, what would happen if a different, younger, dynamic, liberal candidate was put up in such a thing? <laughs> Uh, I'll address, sorry, I don't know your name, so the, the observations you made about YouTube. Um, and uh, again, you know, may have talked at the moment. Uh, I, I think we probably saw the fact that YouTube wasn't putting up a candidate as something that would actually favour Julian Brazier. It just shows how long ago, obviously. But uh, I, when we were sort of discussing this, we, we, we felt that that would play to the Conservatives' strengths rather than uh, to Labour's. Um, the, the issue about how much of uh, Rose's victory is down to anti-Tory sentiment and pro Corbyn uh, policies, I, I just generally don't know. You know I think that's for the setologists to uh, ponder and examine. It's, it's, it's a bit of both, I suspect, but that's not very satisfying. Uh, answer I appreciate. Um, uh, and would, uh, would a young, sprightly liberal uh, under the age of what is it? 49 <laughs> uh, um, win? Probably not if there's an election in a couple of months' time, but you know, who knows if the election is held in 2020? And God knows things change pretty rapidly in politics every week, so uh, who knows? <laughs> Thank you. Um, I kind of, you know, it might be 
not very self-serving, but I kind of welcome a new kind of candidate. I work just as hard and do just the same things and stand for just the same policies in fact whoever I end up standing against. So, you know, in a way it's nice that everyone can get a different choice, you know, not just the same old candidates on the platform. Um, so, you know, bring it on. I <laughs>
what was that about Theresa May's speech? Don't know. You know, there, there's nothing to, to say. And so I think whereas Labour are in a really positive position uh, nationally, and that can be reflected here, uh, the Tories are not. So I, I don't think that a, a kind of jazzy young candidate would, would make a difference. Thank you. Um, again, uh, really interesting. And I, I did think it was a mystery about what happened to the UK firm. I thought that was a really uh, fascinating uh, question. And then, don't knock the 2015 Labour Manifesto, which is Theresa May's taken most of it. This side of the room, perhaps. Sorry. I said I was going to save your legs, and then I'm just pointing to the place I suppose it's the way for you to get to. Uh, the lady with the red glasses on there, please. And then the gentleman behind her with the beard ass boots. Hi, um, thank you We've heard about uh, green swappers, we've heard about liberal democrat swappers. Rosie talked about what some conservatives were saying to her prior to the election. I <coughs> want to ask the panel to be poor. Um, are, are members of the panel aware of the extent to which conservative voters, some of them actually quite long standing, and I met quite a few of them, are you aware um, um, why they actually had a direct swap? They didn't go to Liberal Democrats or Green, they came to Labour. <coughs> now, would you like to uh, advance your opinion as to why that might have been? And would you also like to say whether you think that they might just be transient swappers? Okay, uh, the gentleman behind me, if that's okay. Hello, um, I'm maybe slightly off topic here. I'm a, a, a resident of Rochester and Struden, uh, which was previously a Labour stronghold uh, until 2010. Um, <coughs> many seats were all Labour until 2010. We're back in a situation where three seats now have majorities, quite similar to what Julian <coughs> Fraser had in Canterbury uh, earlier this year. Um, so really my question is, do you think there's a, uh, anything that the Medway seeks to learn from Canterbury, bearing in mind that actually they put quite a different take on Brexit from, from Canterbury, uh, uh, I think a lot more conservative with a small C in many ways. Yep, and uh, yes, the gentleman just on the end. Thank you. Um, there was a perfect storm of events, I think, that contributed to Rosie winning this election, but I think the most important one, and I'm not sure if the panel will agree on that, is the huge increase in turnout that we managed to achieve in this constituency. Julian Brazier's vote actually went up, but we still managed to win this seat. Um, and I think if you can imagine the difference between 64 and 72 percent, I think it was roughly what it was, that means that everybody who voted, who didn't vote the last time, basically voted for Rosie. And I think the main reason for that, I don't know if the panel will agree, is because there was a clear difference between the parties. For too long, we've had political parties that veer to one side or other to the centre. And now there's a clear blue water between them. People realise that voting would make a difference. Voting did actually matter. Great. Okay, so three uh, questions. We'll actually stay on that side because there's a, a veritable forest of bands over there. So, um, Corbyn Tories discuss. I just, that's my phrase. Um, what can Medway learn? And any reflections on turnout, how it was done and what sort of difference it made? And just to reinforce the point about the local elections, remember the turnout between local elections and general elections was, was very different, probably crucial. Uh, I'm going to start with Claire. Um, so, Tory swappers, I think that's a really interesting um, question. And and I would say that um, I, can only, I can only sort of guess, really, but I, I think it probably has a lot, that has a lot to do with, with Brexit um, and, um, and, and kind of Rosie's, Rosie's position as a Remainer. Um, so I think that, um, you know, there are people who would have considered themselves to be sort of centrist Tories, kind of socially acceptable Tories, um, who, uh, who, who decided to kind of go over go over to Labour for that reason. Um, the Rochester and Strews or Medway learnings, I mean, I think that's a really interesting question. I don't know how you kind of totally resolve the, <laughs> resolve the um, Brexit question, but I think one of the massive learnings 
um, that we've sort of talked about a little bit this evening um, in terms of the um, activists <coughs> going out into the villages around here is go to the places where you think you, you know, you haven't necessarily gone and where you might assume that you're not welcome and just kind of go there anyway because people want to be heard. And, uh, and, and I think that kind of goes a long way to, to change people's minds. Um, and the last question, uh, I mean, I, the, the gentleman who was saying about um, uh, the huge increase in turnout and the clear water between the parties, I agree with what you're saying. I mean, there was a massive turnout, uh, increase in turnout from the previous election. But we can also see that we're back to a turnout that, that we have enjoyed in previous uh, years. So, you know, the, the turnout in 2015 was low, um, but um, previously, you know, through the 90s and, um, and earlier uh, 2000s, we, we saw a similar turnout to, to what we saw this year. Um, but I think people had got fed up about you know, two parties being too similar, and so I'm sure that that is a massive reason um, for why people actually turned out to vote for Labour this time. It was going to make a difference. And I would just say, on um, Brazier and, um, and, and him performing well and, and getting a, a 2,000 um, vote increase, um, and, but Brazier still winning, I mean, UKIP had 7,000 votes in the previous election, which in theory should have all gone to him. So I don't think you give him that much credit because where's the other 5,000 going? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, Tories. Um, I, I suppose. <laughs> um, Tories who, who switched to Labour. So it's a real, uh, it's a really important political question. Which, that when, uh, my, my impression is Labour nationally, and particularly Canterbury, and the Northern Canterbury really does prove it, I think. Um, Labour does not need to win over Tory voters. It needs to win over non voters. And that is, and the political implication of that is what we saw in this election now is because of the manifesto, it's because of Brexit, because of all, all, all the ways in which we were radical, we got non voters voting. And if we do that, rather than trying to squabble over the centre ground where we might pick up Tory votes, that is how we win uh, a, a general election. As for Rochester and Stroop, um, I don't know, I, I might be talking out of turn, but my impression is that that local party is very different to Canterbury in its ideological makeup um, somehow. And there might be a lesson there, I, I don't know. Okay. Well, I do know the, the teams at Midway, and we do work together. And at, at, at our Labour Party conference, we have a thing called the South East Reception. And I think I got invited to something like 60 other um, Labour parties around there to tell them how we won. I mean, you know, so I'll be going and talking to them a little bit if I can, but you know, they're very active as well. I think it's just, it's just sort of symptomatic of the times we've had, and I very much agree that this time around, though that I've said this in so many interviews, there was such a difference between that red manifesto and that blue one, we had a very clear choice. And Maybe that hasn't filtered down to Medway. Maybe it's a little bit more of a difficult kind of argument to make. I'm not sure about Brexit. I know Brexit was an issue in Ashford, sort of against the Labour Party. So, you know, there are complicated bits in different areas that, that don't necessarily fit that pattern. As for the Tories kind of lending me their vote or switching over, there's a couple of answers there. I took part in a few panels um, during the Labour Party conference where people were saying, Actually, there's not necessarily such a thing now as a traditional Tory voter or a traditional Labour voter. I think we've got to be a bit more clever about that. People are more aware, you know, straight away due to social media and TV coverage, you can get access to what's going on and what's in manifestos. So you might be bombarded with TV debate or something about manifesto and it hits you in a way that you're not relying on your parents' traditional votes or what you've done in the past or because you're a minor, you will always vote Labour or something. You know, there's those kind of stereotypical, you know, I think we've got to think slightly differently to that. Those issues are what people are voting on. Not necessarily this, I hate the word tribal for lots of reasons, but, but not necessarily with those party lines. I think we need to think about that. Um, and the big increase in turnout, yeah, I think it was due to the difference in those manifestos. <coughs> and, you know, also I'm hugely grateful when Tories say to me, I have always voted Tory, or I did last time, but I'm voting for you because it means that they're trusting me 
to be a good constituency MP. And I'm very mindful of lots of letting them down, as well as traditional Labour voters, obviously, because I'm here for health. So that's important. Uh, so addressing the question, I think it's very good that I know that there are lots of Conservatives return to Labour and the answer is before the pinch. <laughs> <laughs>
first to take a question. Thank you. How do we get more women into politics? I talk about this probably every single day with my Joe Cox from the leadership friends because we've got a big WhatsApp and it's 24 7. Um, basically, just encourage other women and people that I meet that are involved in sort of neighbourhood or residential groups have been involved because whenever I see them getting active in that or the local school or a particular campaign, I will say, hmm, have you thought about standing as a group, you know, or getting more involved? It's just kind of making meetings a little bit more physical on the Making meetings a bit more accessible sometimes. Um, I've been to meetings, I'm not sure the anti-men or anything, but, but often men will really dominate meetings in a way that is quite intimidating actually to women. Um, I don't mean, so that sounds really sexist, like women and little wallflowers, I don't mean that, but it's a, a kind of traditional thing that we aren't necessarily welcome, and how do we get women? I think people like me need to help, you know, to show that there are more women getting there, and we need to encourage everyone else. I'm involved in 50 50 Parliament, and we do various different things to try and get women of all political parties involved. Um, it's just passing it on, talking to each other, and encouraging each other, that's the main thing, I think. Um, National and local issues that won it, ooh, probably a mixture of both, I suppose, but um, mainly, I didn't necessarily campaign on local issues so much. I mean, the hospital is, you know, my big thing, and Brexit and what it means to Canterbury, and those things, you know, housing in Canterbury. But I suppose they came to the national, you know, issues, and then they are relevant to the local areas. So you sort of tweak them to be relevant. and. The only way you really get that is by asking people, what are your number one concerns, rather than telling them, you know, like people are always saying to me, why did students vote for you? Just ask them, you know, you'll get a different answer whoever you, you ask, you know, it's not all that things. So that's not such a straightforward thing. What's the most critical reason I'm oh my God. I'd like to think it's because I genuinely, if it was about me and not Ashley, I'd like to think it's because I really do genuinely want to find out what we can do to make things better here and how I can represent people in Canterbury better than Julian Brazier did. And I, I hope I put that across and I'm really very interested in listening to everyone's ideas. I'm not going to, you know, dictate necessarily what I can do to make things better. I want to know what we should be doing to make things better. I'd like to think that was something that people could get behind. Yeah. Um, yeah, well, the local is, is national, isn't it? And the national is local, the personal is the local. So with the, with the hospital, for example, there's a local issue, but it's only going to be so nationally, it doesn't simply. We don't just have a bad hospital, you know, or a hospital in danger of closure. Um, we have that because of uh, decades of uh, NHS policy hands. Um, so I, I just don't see a split between those those two things. The single most important issue is tuition fees, I think, um, and it's wrong to think that that only appeals to students. Um, uh, that clearly appeals to, to, to working class families who want to send their their children to university. I would never have gone to university under the current um, regime of tuition <coughs> with £50,000 worth of debt, which simply wouldn't have been possible. I think that is, is the radical policy that just we could see overnight if people really, really want to see that. Um, I think that in, in terms of a single factor, that is the most important. Women, which was the first question, how do we get more women into politics? I think um, one of the sort of clearest uh, ways I've ever sort of thought about male privilege is this idea that um, most, not all, most white men can walk into any room and feel like they belong there. And that's not true of all women, and it's definitely not true of um, black and Asian people or, um, or gay people or trans people or you know, and so basically, uh, both online and in the real world in politics, we need to make those rooms more welcoming so that people from all of those groups can feel that they can walk into it, pull up a chair, sit down and get involved, because at the moment they don't. Um, so that's what I say on that. National or local issues, I mean, when we did our survey, it was one of the questions that we asked, what, what, were, the, what were the issues that were motivating people? And it was Brexit number one. 
NHS second and education third. And I would say that it's national and local because obviously everybody around here has their local perspective on those national issues. So, um, but I was, it was overwhelmingly Brexit was the number one thing everybody wanted to talk about. And what's the, the um, biggest reason? Um, I mean, I'm going to slightly cheat and just say that it was the, the perfect storm of Rose was the right candidate at the right time. I think, you know, she was the right type of person coming off of the back of a really good manifesto with Corbyn, you know, um, search <coughs> And so it was the combination of all those factors that, that made it possible. Sorry, that's not the kind of one reason that you're looking for. Uh, I'll be doing a simply brief. So more women in politics. Uh, I don't really know the, the, the answer, but it's interesting to know that Labour is imposing all women in shortlists on, I think it's four or six. The stop talk, Alex Easton, that includes Dover and Kent, but nowhere else. Um, one specific reason, I, I, it's very hard to pick, so I'll flippantly say any, any, uh, anything that you can insert the word progressive in front of probably uh, is uh, one of the reasons. And national, local, I'm going to hand over to Mark in a second. I want to thank Christchurch for hosting this. Uh, I'm from Birkbeck, uh, and one of our most famous students was Karl Marx. <laughs> <laughs> You know, I'm going to pop and say this the other one was Ramsey McDonald. <laughs> <laughs> um, and I think it's really fascinating to talk about all women's shortlist, which was uh, pioneered partly in Birkbeck as well. And the evidence is that it's all women's shortlist that makes a huge, real difference. As much as people seem to complain about them without any evidence, in my experience, that is a thing that really works. Uh, without further ado, I'm going to hand over to Mark to do the thanks. Okay, great. Thank you very much indeed, Ben. Um, I will. Um, I just. I would like to say thank you to all our panelists um, this evening, uh, and thank you um, to our audience uh, as well for keeping your questions uh, brief to the point and on message as well. Um, but I would like to say the final word tonight because I do like. I would like to pass over to my colleague uh, Demetrius uh, Demetrius Maris, who will talk to you a little bit about our. Uh, making politics matter series as well while well, we've got your attention. Thank you for joining me for the closing of this making politics matter event and I would like to take the opportunity to especially thank Rosie Duffield. Uh, and of course the members of our panel, Ben Bishman. into Labour's remarkable Trump has been very clear and very, very uh, insightful. And I'd also like to extend my gratitude to um, Dr. Ben Weather for chairing the panel. Dr. Mark Pennister for organising the whole thing. And most importantly, perhaps our students uh, for contributing to the family and marketing organisation of this event. I'd like to thank you for making this event a success. And in many ways, this event does capture exactly what making politics matter is and should be about. It's a student staff enterprise which seeks to uh, respond to the pressing problem of political disenchantment by creating a public forum and a public space, which will enable us to think politically, to think about politics, and to give voice to various different viewpoints and perspectives across the political spectrum, perhaps even perspectives with which we do not agree with. Uh, our work class does not end here, and I would also like to highlight and invite you to our next Making for It's Matter event. This will take place on the 19th of October at 6 o'clock. We'll slide. be hosting on... Next slide. It's the... We're all slides, okay. Yeah, yeah that's it. <laughs> but that's it. <laughs> <laughs> that's it. We'll be hosting on Edison, uh, MC for Sleeper and Sheffield, and Scott's title for White American Conservative. Thank you for coming. See you then. Yeah.